Hello and welcome to Make Ideas Reality, the podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to everyday creative heroes making their ideas reality that wouldn't necessarily get their story heard. I hope to inspire you with their stories, give you courage to leave your comfort zone, think big, and be the badass creator you are meant to be. I'm Justin White, aka The Garage Avenger. Let's do this! Hello and welcome to episode... Oh shit, it's 24 now. No. Don't ask me, I'm just filling air. <laughs> Hello and welcome to t- episode 24 of Make Ideas Reality. Uh, today I have a guest who loves to swing his hammer in the forge by the day. And <laughs> I can't even <laughs> say this. This is such a bad intro. Oh my god. All right, I'm gonna read I'm, I'm gonna redo this intro because it's so bad. I've got to do it properly. All right, I gotta give it justice. <clears throat> All right, today's guest loved to swing his hammer during the day and throw his keys in a bowl and swing dance at night. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to the show, Rasmus. Uh, Normally I would say thank you, but after that introduction, I'm not so sure anymore. (laughs) (laughs) I told you it was bad. (laughs) You did warn me. I just didn't fathom the scope of it, I guess. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself? We are in, um, we don't often get a chance to be, you know, together. Uh, Norway's cut out their whole, well, not cut out fully, but reduced their um, social distancing levels. Yeah, we're, we're uh, levels. to circulate the virus again. Yeah. And so I decided to come to Rasmus's uh, workshop. Um, it's great to be here. I, it's actually been fantastic uh, just to see alone, let alone just actually see him work. So um, why don't you tell the people who you are, where we are, what this workshop looks amazing to. I'm sure it's got a story. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know where you want me to start with the, the workshop or blacksmithing or... Why don't you start with yourself? <laughs> oh, that's why we're here. Okay. Um, yeah, no, it's um, long story short. I got into blacksmithing after officer school in the army. And instead of doing something sensible and getting a normal job, I figured, hey, that sounds like fun. So I'll try that for a year. And then eight years on, I've just never been able to stop. It's something with a Coke that's addicting. <laughs> I think you have to clarify this is Coca Cola? Oh, n- not Coca Cola. There's blacksmithing coal. Oh, yeah. This stuff. I thought you said Coke. And I no, was like, it, um, is it that what star- it's called? It started out as. Here you go. Um, as coal, yeah. and then as you burn it, you get all the impurities out and you get coke. So Super. it's completely normal for a blacksmith to be carrying 20 kilos of coke on them. That's sort of. Kind of <laughs> crazy. I love it. Love it. Cool. Yeah. Do I just throw it in there? Yeah, yeah, somewhere. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, then like what happens? How do you end up here in this kind of really cool um, workshop? Yeah. Um, I grew up nearby. Uh, so the forge itself is in Drabak, uh, half an hour south of Oslo, yeah. east side of the fjord, because we always give descri- descriptions in Norway relating to the nearest fjord, as, as you do. Yep. And uh, yeah, I grew up in Xi, um, and grew up there running around the forest, playing scouting and setting fire to things. Uh, got into video games and ended up living this really polarized life where I didn't see my family nearly for a couple of years because either I was in front of my computer and being in my own world, or I was out in the forest being crazy with friends and all that. Um, then later on, later on, moving through a series of odd jobs, working in technician at the cinema and things like that, I suddenly heard about blacksmithing at this one school up in the high mountains of Norway. And it, as soon as I heard that, I, it took me three days to both apply and get accepted and find find a place to live nearby, uh, which happens to be my uh, dad's uh, wife, my stepmom's farm, old family farm from late 1600s, early 1700s, hmm. that I would care for when I went to school up there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then I got into blacksmithing and I was just never able to stop and being 21 and having sort of limited views of the future and risk assessments, I figured, 
I can make this work. Yeah, sure. And eight years later, I, I am making it work. Yeah. So, to some extent, mostly. Yeah, well, because I, I mean, you're still doing it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the majority of what you do, right? Yeah, I, well, I've been stepping down to 60 hours a week just around Christmas and not till now. And that's sort of holding steady, not need to go any crazier than that. Yeah. Um, but that's used me 30 to 40 hours in the forge and 10, 20 hours of office work. Mm. So it's, it's uh, yeah, um, it's great fun, mostly. Playing with fire and hitting things and manipulating steel and all that. Can you talk to us about this building and where we are now? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, I distracted myself. <laughs> uh, so uh, I grew up in Xi, and which is sort of slightly inland from where we are. This is the town of Drabak, uh, old port city from going back a thousand years, maybe. And uh, this, I work at Fuller Museum, which is the local museum for all of the area. And they basically have a building park, as I think it's called. So as people want to tear down old buildings, some of them are uh, listed and sort of protected. So they can't tear them down outright, but they can move it. So all of these old buildings from all of the area has been gathered up at this one place, this museum. And this forge is one of those buildings that's been moved here. Uh, I think in this case, this building was moved something like maybe 30 kilometers. I don't even think it, no, not even that far. 20 kilometers maybe. Um, and the building itself is 200 years old. And when I moved here three years ago, uh, I, I talked to the museum and they was really eager to have a blacksmith to work here and get some activity going on at the museum grounds. So they just asked, well, can you use our forge? Or do you need something bigger? And I was like, no, that I can start out here. That's perfect. Mm. Uh, so I basically drew up some plans and they, rebuilt the forge just as i wanted it oh that's super interesting and but it was originally a forge building yeah yeah right? uh, it, it, the building itself was built in 1840 something uh then it was moved here in the 60s 1960s maybe yeah and since then it's been like a stable and uh, general maintenance building and a shed and the other half of the building still is just equipment for the groundskeepers uh, which eventually I'll get access to even all of that. Uh, but we're waiting for them to finish building another couple of buildings that they moved here. Then I can get more space. Yeah. Because I saw too in the, in the back there, they're redoing some of these old log, log type yeah, of buildings. Perfect. And that, oh, that huge one there, yeah. that's massive. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I think that might be the biggest one. There's another big barn over there. That way, I don't know if you saw it when you walked around there. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, so those are two really big buildings, big barns with where they have everything from workshop in one end to stables in the other end and storage and all that in between. Yeah. Uh, Marcel would be frothing off that building over oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> um, it, he, we have some plans of him coming up here at some point, but with the whole virus thing, that's sort of on hold. Yeah. Well, eventually, yeah. eventually. Uh, that's really cool. Love it. Um. Why don't we talk about a little bit of your journey and like, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit that you got into scouts and, and then, you know, through scouts, you then got into blacksmithing. Like, do you want to sort of expand on that a little bit for us? Uh, yeah, I, I guess tell the story I told you earlier today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was at a scout jamboree in Stavanger in 2013 and I had an old mate there who was spending you know, the whole week of the jamboree teasing me about all these cool things he was going to do at the school he had just applied to. Traditional wood carving and the wild mountains and the highlands and nature and majestic and sublime things and all that. Mm. Uh, and, you know, as he was teasing and teasing, I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. That sounds awesome. And then one of the last days of the jamboree, he dropped the big thing of, oh, they, they also had a blacksmithing class one year. Uh, and I was like, they got, they, they got blacksmithing over there? People still do that. And basically the same reaction everyone has when they see me now, mm. pretty much, I had back then. Um, and yeah, three days later, I was accepted at school. Um, but, you know, it, even before that, I had a small taste of it during shop class in eighth, ninth grade or something like that. Mm. But it was more like, oh, this is really cool, and really fancy. And then talking to the guiding counselor and all that, they, I asked, 
I want to play with metal and hot things. And they say, no, that doesn't exist. Uh, and yeah, that's sort of a common thing, I guess, that uh, especially, maybe not especially, but if you haven't heard of it before, you immediately end up with the thought of, I haven't heard of it, so it doesn't exist. Instead of spending five minutes looking it up or just talking to someone else and potentially just pushing me in the direction of fabrication, tire work, you know, something related to that shop class and metal things that I loved back then. Um, but that never happened. So super interesting. Because I, I, you're like you could open a can of worms with that. Because like <laughs> it's something I'm super passionate about. The fact that you know people don't at all hear or see the whole world. You know, especially in the school system, it's very like square. And uh, people like us end up finding the very long way around to go into what they want to go into. So yeah, um, it's I, I think it's. Can quickly boil down to either one or two things, either the just opinion of because I don't know of it, it doesn't exist, mm. uh, or just laziness and not bothering to check, or maybe a combination of the two. Yeah, but it's well, the school system itself isn't made to fit everyone by definition, it's supposed to get as many as people through one funnel as convenient as possible for everyone, mm. hopefully, for everyone, sometimes only convenient for the teachers, but that's. That's a different story, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I don't know, it's, that's annoying. Just the mentality of, I don't know of it, so it doesn't exist. Mm. What about, uh, tell the people about your work. What, what real side of, you know, forging and blacksmithing do you really love to do? Problem solving. Because there's huge, I mean, the, I mean, I had no clue, you know, yeah. blacksmithing is really broad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think the official guild list, if, either for Norway or Oslo, I can't recall, uh, they had 130 different specializations of blacksmith registered yeah. 100 years ago, yeah. 200 years ago. And uh, out of those, basically, you have toolmaker, uh, machinists, and uh, gunsmith that still exist in modern Norway, at least. We don't have weaponsmith. Uh, we have farriers, but that, I think even then was a different part of the craft. I might be wrong. We don't have wagon makers, tire makers. We don't have scissor smiths or knife smiths. We have the hobbyists, but we don't have anyone who solely make that as a primary source anymore. Well, there are a few who makes axes, but even they have, I think, at least those I know more or less personally, either have a secondary job to get some income or their business are sort of uh, spread between a few different sides of craft. Mm. Uh, especially me, I make a bit of everything. I made a couple of axes. I make a lot of tools, mostly for myself. I, uh, I make a lot of knife blades recently and I make also, surprisingly, a lot of flowers, metal flowers. And aside to that, I try to do some uh, leaf bowls, just dishing out big leaves and making bowls and things out of that. And mm. um, but, you know, in shortly speaking, I do three different kinds of jobs. I do custom work, bigger things like railings and gates and that kind of thing. Um, there's less of that, but that's, that's a big part of it. So there's classes and teaching. And then there's uh, small interior things, like just every kind of knickknack you'll, well, not knickknacks, but uh, things you'll find at craft fairs, hooks and nails, uh, knife blades, basically mostly things that cost under a uh, thousand crowns, hundred bucks there, but yeah. Um, but that's sort of the three big sides of it. But then there's you know X number of things beneath all of that. Out of all the products that you do make, what do you like? What's the thing you love to make when you get the chance? Um, I really love the problem solving of prototyping and working out a good process for work, making anything. That's always great fun. But recently I've been having a lot of fun making roses, steel and stainless steel roses. Uh, just, which is still sort of that thing of, I have just recently figured out a really good way of making them. But every 10th rose I make, I 
realize that, oh, if I try this little twist there or add a nick here and here, mm. suddenly there's a whole other dimension to the piece. Maybe not striking to anyone outside of me, but after I've seen like a couple of hundreds of the same kind of rows, and then suddenly there's another one and it's different and there's something more to it. Uh, I like that. I like that a lot. Because I, I had no clue. Like I tried now just to do <laughs> some, oh, uh, it's some, it was so bad. And I think, I think you really got to understand that fact that, you know, it's a skill that takes years probably to get good at and decades to master. Uh, blacksmithing isn't difficult at all. Uh, it's not advanced, but it's complex mm. in the sense that there's a lot of tiny things, small things you need to always remember and keep in mind and work with but none of them are hard in itself. The only difficult part is being efficient and quick about it. And uh, also spotting your mistakes early enough for them not to be yeah, problems. Which is 100% not what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to play for 30 minutes or something like that. Not even, but... I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I'm, I also really love that monotonous thing of, I need to make this bit X number of centimeters longer. And I need to do it as few as it is possible and just practice that until I get it. Uh, I love that monotony, doing 50, 100 or something just to practice drawing out the taper quickly. I really enjoy that. Uh, and I might be because I've got brainwashed doing karate. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I never mentioned that earlier. No. But I, I, um, I started doing karate when I was six years old and I still haven't properly stopped. I just haven't been good at practicing the last five, six years. Uh, but it, back then, especially going to the summer camps and training with the traditional senseis from Japan, they would easily tell us, today we'll practice this thing and we'll do that today. And we will be standing there doing this 10,000 times for hours. And every once in a while, he would just say stop and everyone would freeze and hold the pose and he will walk around and he will adjust minor things until everything is correct. And then he will speak in really broken English, do it slowly and everyone would slowly go through it. And then he would just stop and it will be there and then finish. And that thing, I, I still really love that. I Simply because my body is doing one thing and I can focus on single pieces of the process. And then also my head can just be completely gone and think about everything else. Yeah, because I, I saw that a little bit when you were working and I was watching and doing a little bit of filming. I, I saw you were like in this zone, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. I, I nearly couldn't talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Uh, it's I definitely fall into some kind of zone. Um, no doubt about it. Um, but it's also a thing of just being conscious of what I'm doing, but it's, I'm still hearing what you're saying. I just honestly struggle with formulating an answer while I'm swinging the hammer. And because there's a lot of things going on, right? You know, yeah, but none of them are conscious. It's not like, oh, I see it's going crooked in that corner. Mm. I need to, it's not just, I'm just looking and hitting and looking and hitting. And in between, well, every time you hear me striking the anvil, that's the moment I'm thinking. Interesting. Yeah, that's the moment I'm thinking and looking, and the next time I adjust and I correct whatever I saw, or I move on. So you, you talked about prototyping was like a big thing you yeah. really love to do. What's your process with a prototype? You come with an idea, how does it formulate, how does it lay out for you? Uh, it depends a lot. Usually I end up with a sketch. I'm watching a movie, playing a game, and I see something that it would just make me think, oh, I've been meaning to make something like that, and I like that design. I'll sketch that down, put it on a post-it knot, and I put it on the board. And it stays on that board for a couple of years, usually, and until I either remember sketching it, and then just work with it in the forge with what I remember. And sort of the, the distance between me sketching it and then making it is enough for me to never worry about copying someone's design outright. Also because it's handmade, it will be different anyway. Mm. And I have no idea usually what starting stock they used and the process they used. Uh, especially if it comes to something in a video game, most of those things sort of is traditionally made. 
whatever that means in that video game. Yeah. So when I come here and I think, oh, I want to create like the fleur de lis, the the big. It's also the scout symbol, the big uh, clover and lily. Yeah. And I say, oh, I want to make something with that. I have two ways of doing that easily: either getting a big hunk of plate, sketching it out and drawing it, uh, sketching it out and cutting it. Or I can sit on my computer, I can sketch it out in a vector file and send it off to the laser company and just get the finished piece. Both of those things will give, for the most part, the same result. But there will be differences to notice in them if you know what to look for. Like the edges will have a slight chamfer if they're cut by hand because the chisel got an angle to it. Mm. Whereas the laser would have that perfectly 90 corner that almost is so sharp you can cut yourself on them. And then it's a bit of manipulating that to either make it look natural or to give it the final shape that I want. I could make those and dish them out and make bowls out of them where I can, like I did uh, the Scout Jamboree in Boulder three years ago. Uh, I cut it by hand and I made a big flower, like 160 tall, uh, and it weighs 25 kilos or something. Yeah. Just massive flower I cut, I built on, <laughs> on, on the premises. Because I brought my forge up to Boulder, which is really sensible when it's only a 20 hour drive. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it, and that kind of thing is really fun just to have an idea. And I talked to them up there and they said, yeah, if you can do that, that's brilliant. And we'll pay for your expenses to get everything up there and all that. And it's like, cool, yes, please. And with the money I got there, I actually bought that forge, the gas forge. So yeah. it, all, it all plays in the hand, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I said, it's, you know, half the things are just sketches and post-it notes. And if I get a specific client request, I sketch it out, I send it off to them, and then I copy that sketch and bring it to the forge. I have some reference, so at least staying within the ballpark of what I sent them. Mm. Usually people tell me, we want something that looks like this, yay big. Hopefully they say me yay big. <laughs> Usually they don't. And then they say, have fun with it. We trust your judgment, your creative uh, process. Yeah. Um, other times people want exactly the thing I send them down to the millimeter. Like, for example, in making tools, like planes and all that. Uh, plane blades, mm. airplanes, different things. <laughs> oh, you don't make planes in your forge? I don't understand. Yeah, no, I, it would be fun to try to make a boomerang, but I thought we'd probably end up killing someone. <laughs> I'm not quite sure it would fly, actually. Uh, aerodynamics. Yeah. Would, it, Thin enough, strong enough. Yeah, yeah, true. I was just thinking, like, steel is probably a bit heavy. Oh, if that. it's thick, it is. Yeah. You can, you can get sheets of spring steel. That would be insanely dangerous, especially if you end up with, like I would, like slightly uh, sharpen the edges, because then you can't catch it. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you ever thrown a boomerang? Uh, once or twice. Yeah. All right. Well, let's just leave it there. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to see, I, I had this vision of you just getting decapitated by your own boomerang. <laughs> like, probably I got it, I got it, I got yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't got it. <laughs> yeah, let's agree. Let's leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about swing dancing, man, because it's kind of a fun thing to like. It's very contrast: metal forging, hot metal, very manly thing, right? And in 2020. Swing dancing is a bit old-fashioned, a bit like girly, like most men would think that's kind of kind of a not so masculine thing to do, right? Well, I would say that might be your opinion if you're not dancing. 100%, right? <laughs> um, because, yeah, no, there's... Um, first off, I, I got into swing dancing because I live by myself and I work by myself. And when you start that sort of crazy, you just quickly end up going more crazy if you don't talk to people. So uh, that's that's one side of the whole thing, just meeting people and being social. Uh, having that schedule when you're an introvert is really good because I know that I'm going on the bus, I'm sitting on my house for an hour getting to the city, then I'll have X number of hours of classes, maybe socializing, then I'm home and I'm free. You know, it's easy to manage when you're introverted. And I'm introverted enough that after I've been social dancing uh, and all that, I'll get home, I don't want to talk to anyone for a week. And that's just a couple of hours. So that's where it started out as. Uh, but sort of the reason, the little nudge that got me into it was that I moved back from uh, where I started. I started the business up near Gardemund in the middle of the forest in Hurdal. 
uh, and uh, then I moved back home, so to speak. Drebak, though, even not she, but same, same. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to do something and um, I didn't really want to get back full into karate. And but I really, I've always wanted to learn how to swing dance. And I had a couple of friends who started a couple of years before me who was really nudging me along to, yes, come along, do it, get it all done. But also it was the most terrifying thing I could imagine doing. And it proved to be one of the most difficult things I've ever tried to do. Because before getting into all of that, I had no sense of rhythm at all. Yeah. So I need to learn not only how to listen to music, but how to follow the beat of music and everything in between all of that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it helps that, you know, there's girls and just social and it's challenges and it's a bit of a workout. And yeah, even though this is a really physical job, it doesn't feel like a workout in that sense anymore. Not because I'm that insanely strong or anything like that. It's just it becomes mundane and every day. Uh, but you you get that muscle memory to your body doesn't get sore in the same way after, yeah. after, after yeah. a while, right? Yeah, uh, and, you know, I can swing a hammer and whack it till I'm sore, but then I'll need to take a break because I need to be able to work the day afterwards as well. So uh, I need to manage myself a little bit, but still I, I can go at it for eight hours straight with a hammer in hand. Uh, and, you know, spending 40 hours in here a week doing that. Yeah, I can do that. Going more than that or more than 10 hours with a hammer a day, multiple days in a row, I start to feel it. Then I'm starting to feel a little bit worn out. Mm. Um, so I guess that also plays into going dancing because it's a good break from everything. And having the schedule and tossing money at someone's classes sort of entices me to, yes, I need a break and I'm going to be social and I'm sort of covering all of my bases to more or less stay sane. <laughs> what about, you're a bit of a, Bit of a nerdy kind of person. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I think we all are in some ways. Like, yeah, we yeah. all like our things. Like I'm really into like rallying and like weird superhero things. Like I, that's, I like it. That's my thing. And everyone has their thing. And, um, you know, how do you find that comes through in your work as well? Uh, in what sense now? So like, you know, for example, you like, you know, um, f <laughs> you know, th there was oh. a whole thing with the Firefly thing, you know, oh, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and you the know, Firefly series, yeah, right, and yeah. and so everyone jumped on board, and people were using a lot of that, the nuances from that series or movie, yeah. and series, um, uh, to 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 basically influence their work, and and that's kind of what I'm thinking. It's like, does it come through your work? Um, not directly. Not really. Uh, I really love learning out about the traditional ways of making things mm. and doing that. Uh, like the traditional process of forging an axe. Like not only figuring that out because that's sort of common knowledge now, but also recreating it, doing the same process, even though materials are different now and all that. You know, doing things as traditional as possible while still trying to keep costs down and make a product that's actually something people can buy. Um, so yeah, I, I know that a lot in that respect. Something that happened over the last couple of months uh, specifically is that I'm, I started to do a little thing that's more directly from uh, video games and movies. Yeah. Uh, first off, for I started it for last year's Sunday Weapon Apocalypse Challenge by Dirty Smith, Rory May, yeah. where I started out and roughed out the Keyblade, the Master Keyblade from Kingdom Hearts. Uh, and I didn't finish completely for by then, but I finished it uh, in early February this year. And that, that's you know that's a big key with sharp edges, and it weighs like ten kilos or something. Yeah. And I tried to make it light. Uh, so yeah, I, I do that kind of thing. But I never played those games. I saw a let's play uh, from the Region Games magazine, and I just thought it would be fun to make that. And I can't keep it here, but it would be fun to make it just on the March of the series. And then I thought, well, he, the guy who had the Let's Play series, he really, really loves this series. So I was like, all right, I know some of his colleagues because I met them a couple of times at conventions and things like that. Mm. So I reached out to them and said, hey, if I finish this off, could we 
do a sort of secret handover and surprise him with it. Uh, and we were able to do, do that. And that was that was great fun. Not so much the making of it, because there were so many things in it that I cocked up and was frustrating, because it was a lot of fabrication in it, and I'm not a good welder. And I don't have a good welder even. I have a stick welder. I was doing sheet things, and it was a thing. Problems. Lots of them. Um, but just handing that over was great fun and just seeing his face and also the whole thing of handing this massive key over to him and warning him this is heavy and he just grabs it and goes clunk and this is bloody heavy. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's a great fun things. And then uh, it must be like a couple of weeks after that, by coincidence, I got uh, talking to uh, some prop makers in the UK who was going to recreate a bag end for Comic-Con Liverpool in the beginning of March. Mm. And they uh, they asked me, hey, can I make sort of the fireplace tom that Gandalf used to pick the one ring out of the fire yeah, in bag yeah, end? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, sure, I can, I can do that. By all means, do you have you know, reference things and sketches? And I was like, and he was like, here's screenshots. Half of them was taking me the cell phone off the screen on telly and all that. I was like, yeah, thank you. I'll see what I can do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I got through the central sketches back and forth. And then, oh, can you do the whole set, whole fireplace set? I was like, yeah, but if you're running out of time, yeah, don't, don't worry about that. Can you do it? I was like, yeah. And the brazier, the, the fire basket, everything burns in. Can you make that as well? I was like, yeah, sh sure, I can do that. And I'm a massive Lord of Rings nerd. Uh, the Hobbit, I think, was one of the first books I read, and definitely the first book I read in English. Uh, so I was all over that, and I went over and I, I had to bring it on the plane, so I had to do all of the rough forging here, and then bring it over in sticks in my backpack on the plane to uh, Al's hack shack. Oh, holy and shit, I, I didn't realize. his setup, and I basically had to fix up his forging setup so it will function decently. To then finish everything and then take the train from Leeds with you know fire brazier in one hand and sticks of iron sticking off the back of my backpack and walking on the train and everyone looking like, like I'm possessed by a demon or something, uh, and, and then they're handing all of this over and just having the reception by him here and this again is massively brilliant. But that, again, it's more of just solving the problem of something interesting that really drives me. The fact that I love the series and I just really want to work with creating all of that, that's brilliant because mm -hmm. now I still have the sketches. I have most of the process still in my head. Yeah. So you want to recreate it. Or as she said, he wants to have this as a product line, the brazier and the fireplace tools. No idea if that will ever pan out. That would be fun. Yeah. I, I had no idea that you had to do the, I, like I remember hearing you on Fools and Tools podcast yeah. <laughs> saying that you were there, but I, I forgot that you were over there finishing it off. Yeah. And that's kind of a, like a, <laughs> you have the red hot iron up your ass basically to get it finished oh, in time. Oh, definitely. Yeah. One thing is getting as much, uh, or getting all the critical things done here, yeah. the tools I have and how I know how to do it. Mm. And then getting over there and just hoping that, first off, Al's got the tools I need. Secondly, that his tools will work. And if you see in any of Al's Hack Shack's videos, you know, there's a lot of shady things going on in that shed. <laughs> um, I think that was nearly story time, that one, but we will go into story time now. Have you got a story to spin and, and share with the audience? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, depends on what kind of story you want, I guess. Well, lay it on us, let's go. Um, yeah, I could do... There's a bridging story in between officer school and getting into blacksmithing. Probably the week or a couple of weeks after to Jamboree, and I sort of had a bite for school. Um, to a lot of happenstance, I happened to be at a party uh, with uh, my boss in the army, which in itself is sort of shady, even though he's civilian and I was military, so it's think <laughs> different things, but it was shady. Yeah. At least by official standards back then, probably even more so now. But, uh, but one of his old mates uh, happens to be one of the world's best hypnotists, Turgrim Holte. Okay. He had like, uh, I, I didn't really know all of this when I first met him. He was just this weird, round, happy guy, hypnotizing people on stage, which was making a great show. And, you know, he was also really into scuba diving. 
And all of us who was at that party and sort of worked with my boss, he invited all of us down to his place in Spain to learn scuba diving. And even because I was 20, 21 and an utter idiot, or because I was the only one mad enough, that you, that's up for debate, but I was the only one who took him up on the offer. So I flew down to his place in Spain and learned how to scuba dive for a week. And then I got back home and I told it to a couple of friends and I was like, who, wait, what? You, you know what he does? And I was like, yeah, he's a hypnotist. Yeah, no, he's one of the world's best hypnotists. So was he like, look into my eyes, look into my eyes, Erasmus, you will not. <laughs> well, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> But that doesn't really prove anything. <laughs> but, uh, were you, was your, did you feel normal after you yeah, came yeah, back from there? There know, was we, no I, sore I remember, ass or anything? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that joke before. Um, <laughs> no, um, uh, we, we talked a lot. Um, went out to dinner and a couple of things like that. A great time. Lovely guy. Really eccentric, really weird. And some of my friends keep insisting that I keep attracting them to kind of those kind of people. I have no idea what they mean. Um, but that's apparently a thing. <laughs> Uh, but you know, he, he, he talked a little bit about that and how he got into hypnotizing because he himself uh, was in the Marines in Norway, uh, and that's how sort of how he got into the scuba thing. And he was deployed somewhere and was bored out of his mind, and he had a book on hypnotism. Hmm. So he just started practicing on his mates in the bunk. So interesting. Yeah, and then he just escalated wildly from there. To some extent, I guess. Um, it makes me laugh because I'm thinking about the whole time you're talking about this guy. I'm thinking about the little the guy from Little Britain, the hypnotist. <laughs> <in. laughs> That's um, really shit, and no I don't one think you're too far off. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's um, yeah, uh, like round and jolly. It's a simple way of putting it. Let's um let's actually take a little break. We've got an Instagram live going on. Is there anyone saying anything? I think so. There's people saying hi. Man, can make you waiting at this and all that. But yeah, it's. Um, guys, I forgot a random question <laughs> to ask for uh, for Rasmus. So, if you can comment a random question for the show, I will use it. All right. <laughs> so, one, two, happen. three, go, people. Random question. Um, let's get back onto it. Let's go into. Uh, inspiration Nation. <laughs> you got any people that inspire you? Maybe the lesser known people? Yeah. Give me a second. Um, I, I, it's, it depends a little bit in sort of what direction you're moving. Because vastly different people inspire me to vastly different things. Mm. Uh, like after getting into swing dancing, following a couple of the swing dances on YouTube is brilliant, even though sort of all they're doing is showing off sort of show reels from competitions. Uh, but it's full songs and it's routines sometimes, but most of the time it's unplanned random song, random follower, and they're just dancing and having fun. That's brilliant. So if you want to do things like that, you could start looking into Ben Morris Swing Dancing, I think his channel is, and the official West Coast Swing Dance Channel yeah. uh, on YouTube. Uh, which, you know, if you're curious about it and you just want to see people having fun, it's brilliant. Um, it comes to trades and all that. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of torn between sort of shouting out both Jürgen Stray, Thaddeus Mesta, and Jamie Reader, because all of them are brilliant lads. Can be proper cocks sometimes, <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> but they, they also... All of them have sort of their different side of the naked community where they are just being a pillar of helping people. Mm. Always ready to answer questions and help out. Jamie, especially now, with helping out and up, uh, uploading Steve with the whole Schools for Fools thing. Uh, getting all of that recorded, making sure everyone is set up right before everything starts, getting the links out to people. All of this. I have no idea how much work it is. I just know that it's a lot, especially when you have, what is it now, 10 different classes going or something like that. Mm. Um, and Tidy of doing all of his wood carvings and spoon carvings, it's always brilliant, especially when it starts to go just whacking a tree in the forest and making a face in it. That's fantastic. It's brilliant. It's a bit scary to see 
him walking around with an axe because he's massive, but he's also cuddly, so it evens <laughs> out. And then Jürgen Strait now just having his new workshop going on, and he's still at the mess, but just seeing him going from the horrible, I think it was diesel-powered uh, foundry he got, stepping up to an electric foundry and a bigger workshop, which is still a big mess, and they still need to build in a couple of floors to make it workable, but it's just seeing how he's transitioning transitioning into making that a bigger thing, a more efficient thing. If you only knew how much stuff you were there, oh my god. I, I, actually, I stopped by during Easter just to say hello. And he had moved, he had made two paths into the workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so you could walk in and he could he had started to level out his X carve, I think it is, and he is getting the foundry things more or less in place and that. Uh, and his uh, Yedman and his mates, uh, Blacksmith's board, just sort of set up and they, they got sort of square meter space to do that in yeah. different things. It's, I'm really, really looking forward to see how all of that develops. I, I can't next. wait to borrow all these tools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can live there, by. So. Yeah. I'm like a 20 minute drive from him. And yeah, I guess you can use that as a refuge from the kids and wife and all that. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get that, but. Yeah. <laughs> One could dream and hope. Yeah, one could. Dream. And is there any uh, any random questions that anyone have written up? Um, if everyone in the world stopped sneezing forever, how long would it take for us to notice? That's a good one for NMD woodworks. Oh, how would that be? Because sneezing isn't something you talk about in that sense. No. You notice it when people do it. But even though, actually, do you? I mean, now we do because of coronavirus. Oh, definitely but, now. Definitely yeah, now. right. Normally, like if you asked me six months ago, uh, I don't think I would have noticed myself. Maybe after either someone told me or after a month, where I'm suddenly stopping and thinking, something's been missing, something has not been registering right, <laughs> and it's like, wait a second, and it'll probably take me a while just to figure out what it is. I don't know, maybe a month. I I'll just uh, I'll be waiting for the press release uh, like on the news like <laughs> sneezing is stopped throughout the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Hey, uh, man, your doomsday shelters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could could be something like that. <laughs> um, let's go into hack attack. Any any tips or tricks for the people out there? Um, you know what? Magnets. Magnets are wicked cool. So I have. Magnets all over. First off, my whole workspace is one big steel plate because then I can leave hot things on, on it because uh, without it catching fire. Yeah. And then I have a back plate also full of steel, mostly to catch welding splatter and grinding dust and all that. Yeah. Um, but because it's steel, I can use magnet to put all of my notes and schematics up, which is brilliant. But I also have ended up using magnets sort of around the shop and different things. So if you look on the leg of the uh, uh, the gas table there. Yeah. I have a magnet glued on there where I keep that one wrench that fits to the gas. Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, I have, you see the extra arm for the rest next to the door? Yeah. I have a magnet keeping that in place as well. Oh, yeah. And next to, I have a magnet up on the drill press to keep the screws I'm using so I can double check if I can't be sunk deep enough. Huh. That's smart because you always need that one thing. And when you put it in yeah. a drawer, or put it in a little like thing, it always goes missing. And, and, and yeah, that's one thing. Another thing, if you're using this one thing to this one purpose every single time, keep it nearby. Yeah. That's sort of just a simple thing. But then you can take all of the magnets a step further because you can get 3D printed magnets, custom made magnets, snap lock magnets that only work when you twist them in 60, 90, 180 degrees. Mm. And then you can use them as locks and things. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's wicked. It's really cool. And you got magnets to use as springs even. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. yeah. So if you want more like magnet magic, that's a fun word. Um, smarter every day. Uh, Dustin, he had, I think it's a year old now. It could be even longer. I don't recall. But he got um, a whole video in depth on how they make these magnets, different purposes of them. And they are not expensive at all. If you want to have one kind of build where you want this sort of magical custom thing, mm. like uh, a hidden drawer where you just twist a knob and it unlocks, use a magnet, it would be really cool. 
Oh, interesting. I might have to think about that. Yeah. Um, that it, like it, you know, also, you can just Google custom snap lock magnets, spring magnets. You can just Google all of that. You'll find a couple of uh, companies that makes them. Uh, you can have custom magnets made where they will uh, use a laser to only magnetize parts of the uh, steel plate or magnetite or whatever it is, mm. so that you can have custom logos that only shows when you have steel dust on it, for example. Ah, oh, get out of town. That's awesome. No idea how much that will cost, but you can do it. It would be cool. That's cool. Um, it's before we finish and wrap up, is there anything you want to uh, leave with our audience? Uh, oh, I, I can ramble on forever. Uh, <laughs> if, like I think you noticed. Um, yeah, there's one thing we can talk about. So just lowering the threshold of talking to people. Yeah. You get know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. One thing is sending a message these days and asking how people are doing. That's, yeah. that's big, that's important. Everyone appreciates you have to check up, a chat about something they're doing. Brilliant. Especially, especially if you can connect it to something they're doing or ask them for a little help or a tip or something. Mm. People feel vastly valued if you can do that to them. Uh, and also in general, if spend five minutes a day, go to the bottom of your messages and send a message to someone that you haven't talked to in ages and just ask, what are you doing? What's your thing now? Yeah. I, I, you know what I also love to do? I just send random voice messages because... Voice messages are miserable. Come on. You love, you hate them. Cause, yeah. Because you can't, because <laughs> you can't control them. I, I love them because they are so quick and simple and yeah, to the point. Quick for you, but a message I can read at a glance and True I can get that. notes from it. A message I need to listen to and I need to take notes from it to get the points of it. But that's, that's kind of, I agree with you there. <laughs> but what I would say is in the time it takes me to write that message, I could have sent 10, 20 voice messages. Sure, but then then I guess the question is, whose time do you value the most? Mine. Well, egomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, to be fair though, it's uh, uh, coming from communica basic communication theory, as the sender of any kind of message, it's your responsibility to use the right medium and phrasing to make sure that not the words reach the person, but that the meaning behind them is translated rightly. Mm. And that, that, that doesn't not even across language barriers. That just what does this word mean to someone else? Me talking about heats and steels and grain structure and all that. That means something completely different than when you're ta I'm talking to a woodworker. Yeah, but I would say one thing. That's all well and good, but you're not taking into account the person on the other side and where their headspace is at at the minute. Because sure. if they're in a bad space, they'll read anything in a negative thought. Oh, yeah, 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 if course. they're in a good space, they'll read it in a positive thought, despite the fact of whatever that, level you, you sent that, that message at. you can't account for outright. But you can get a gist for it as you're talking to them, and you can adjust. Well, that, that's why verbal yeah. communication is really good. And that's why I think there's a lot less uh, miscommunication with a voice message. You get tone, you understand where they're coming from. It's you, you don't get wrapped up in like, oh, he said that word, which I'm, <laughs> because of the mood I'm in, yeah, yeah. thinks that I, you know, but, he's being an asshole. Um, Anyone who's been through some form of depression will also know that it doesn't matter what anyone says to you, really, because it's how your brain is working in the moment that's messing everything up. Mm. So, yeah, right tonality. It, it, in, the, in the perfect world, there is a perfect message that you can send someone and they will perfectly understand exactly what you mean and or you can send that message and get them out of the funk. In a perfect world, that exists. We don't live in a perfect world, but we can approach and try to be perfect, just knowing that it's an achievable, but having as a stretch goal, something to go towards. And with that in mind, uh, this is me overthinking a lot. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the thing with, if I can spend 30 seconds longer to write this message out and save having to write another five messages, three messages, one message, I consider that worth it. Not so much for my time, because I'm the one imposing on them. My time is irrelevant. That's my point of view. But I want something out of this. I want something from them. Either if it's just a tip or 
just a comment on something I did wrong or rightly and it's there about. I still want their time and I want them to have the easiest threshold for actually giving me that thing. And there's a bird in the porch now. And now it's gone. You looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at scaring birds. <laughs> Clearly. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's my point of view. But I don't know. No, I think it's valuable. I mean, you know, everyone thinks about things differently. Like I have my perspective, um, but it's it's based on my reality and my world that I live in, you know. And and by the um, by the community you're also in, if everyone you know is sending voice messages, being the one guy who sent text, that will bother everyone, <laughs> right? Yeah, because I I you guys don't know, but I sent Oliver voice text to Rasmus, so <laughs> he's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Annoyed, really frustrated. <laughs> Not fully pissed. Yet. All right, let's wrap it up, Rasmus. Where can people find you, mate? Oh, I'm Rasmus Low, and everywhere it's mostly social: uh, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, Web page is Lowensmear or RasmusLowen.no. Yeah, maybe in .com. I think I have that watching as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, cool. All kinds of weird nerdy things about blacksmithing and nerdy things in general and sometimes I dare to post swing dancing even though people hate me for it sometimes. <laughs> That's because they're jealous because they don't have the rhythm. I would like to think so. I would like to think so. You know it. You know it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining us. I've got to look at this camera. <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us uh, with uh, Rasmus. I'm going to say his name wrong because I, I don't know why I say this wrong. L no. Luan. Luan. Yeah. Because I want to. I, I keep on thinking it's Leon because I get the oh, yeah. E and the O swapped in my head. Every time I talk to someone who knows French, it's yeah. Leon immediately. Yeah. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, um, Norwegian names are hard. Hey, question for you, by yeah. the way. My, I was talking about my wife to my wife about uh, your name. <laughs> yeah. And I said like, how like. Ospion, you can kind of like laugh about it because if you read it, it says like, ass bear. <laughs> like, and then she was joking and she said that if you say Rasmus, it sounds like ass mouse. <laughs> yeah, no, it, uh, that's the literally the butter joke I grew up with because the, the joke, well, in Norwegian, mouse can also be pussy. Is it? Yeah, uh, like like the name for the animal became yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing. Yeah. Uh, also, My Girl's Pussy, really good song, swing song from the 20s. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I have not had this confirmed by anyone. Well, but yeah. that's probably the reason why pussy can mean what it means. Well, you heard it from us, pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, basically, yes. So, yeah, that's the better joke I grew up with, how I got marked See, every time someone wanted to. Actually, I, I don't like us, pussy. I, I like the idea of like. You know, ass mouse sounds funnier and, yeah. and cooler. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, and the thing is, I, I haven't heard that joke in a uh, long time. No, well, people say it like, oh, so they do the thing. Oh, you're named after both your mom's your mom's holes. Oh uh, no, really? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a common oh, thing. Better. And I just stare at them and like, yeah, I've heard that for literally twenty eight years. Well done. <laughs> well, it's a little bit like you know, oh, it's just in time. You know, like. Something, something, yeah. yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Oh man, all right. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us with uh, Rasmus. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, please stay tuned for uh, the next uh, podcast coming up soon. Um, we've got lots of line, uh, lots of awesome guests lined up, so looking forward to sharing them with you guys. Um, look, I'm just going to say, like I always say, um, you know, this podcast is dedicated to makers and creatives just like yourselves so if you want to support them you know please just share um you know rate the podcast um make an instagram story and and get them and give them the justice to to be found by a bigger audience um that's what it's all about uh thanks again for everyone joining us and uh we'll catch you on the flip side so yeah thanks for listening guys if you dig the podcast you can get exclusive access to unedited pre-podcast chats along with early access to each episode every single week by heading over to Patreon. Uh, there's a link in the show notes, so just follow that. 
Uh, love you guys. Hope you have an awesome rest of your week and I'll catch you on the flip side.